Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the international affairs, foreign policy, and global development community, and world news aficionados of all stripes. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg, editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. My guest today, Hannah Mehan Davis, comes from a long line of democracy activists in Hong Kong. Today, they are all either in exile, facing arrest, or somewhere in between. Hana Mehan Davis is the author of the new book, For the Love of Hong Kong, a memoir from my city under siege. This is her first book, and I am very proud to announce that this is the first book under the new Global Dispatches publishing imprint. The book tells the story of Hana's family and friends who have been on the front line of an epic struggle to defend democracy, freedom of speech, and human rights in the face of increasing repression by Chinese authorities. Hana comes from a generation of Hong Kongers born just after the handover of Hong Kong from British rule to the government of China in 1997. Her parents are prominent pro-democracy activists and academics. Her godfather, the man who walked her mom down the aisle at her wedding and for whom Hana's name honors, is Martin Lee, who is known around the world as the father of Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement. In her book, she weaves together stories from generations of activists into her own personal history to give readers a real visceral sense of how rapidly Hong Kong has transitioned from a bastion of liberty and free speech to a place where dissent has been criminalized. Whereas just a couple of years ago, millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets in mass protest, Today, Hong Kongers face arrest for what might be written on a protest sign or a post on social media. This societal transition is profound and one that Hana masterfully explores in her book. The book itself is a short read. It's about the length of a magazine and can be read in one or two sittings. Please buy the book and share it with others. I am so proud to have helped bring this story to life and am so excited for the future of the Global Dispatch's publishing imprint. I commissioned this book with you, the podcast listener, in mind, and so I would so appreciate your feedback and learning what you think about this book. So again, please buy the book. You can find the links in the show notes of this episode or go to globaldispatchespodcast.com. And in fact, I created a new website, globaldispatches.org, where you can also find this book. Don't worry, I will make it easy for you to buy it. So in this episode, we don't actually discuss the book too much in detail, and that's deliberate. I want you to read it. Uh, Rather, in this episode, we discuss Hong Kong's history and key moments in its recent and rapid transformation from a liberal society to an increasingly authoritarian one. This conversation really does serve as a companion to the book. So enjoy the conversation. Let me know what you think of the book. And now here is my conversation with Hana Mehan Davis, author of For the Love of Hong Kong, a memoir from my city under siege. Hong Kong started as a kind of cluster of farming fishing villages on China's southern shore. In 1842, the Qing Dynasty at the time ceded Hong Kong to the British Empire through the Treaty of Nanjing, which was one of the many unequal treaties signed at the time at the conclusion of the first Opium War, which China had lost. Hong Kong Island then became a British crown colony. And when Britain also won the Second Opium War in 1860, the Qing Empire was once again forced to cede territory to the UK. Um, and at that time, it ceded Kowloon Peninsula, which is not an island, but kind of became part of what makes up Hong Kong today. Or the last territory district in Hong Kong that was ceded was in 1898. 
where the new territories was actually leased for 99 years, which kind of set into its claws at the time, this 1997 kind of point of questioning, point of reckoning of what would happen with not only the new territories, but the rest of Hong Kong. Um, so that was kind of locked in. And the combination of those three kind of districts make up what we recognize as Hong Kong today geographically. Under British colonialism, which of course was not without its ills in Hong Kong, the city kind of flourished into a trade hub for a lot of the British Commonwealth, British colonies across Asia and across just the world. Um, and it flourished as an economy. It flourished as a place where people could really palpably taste what freedom and what human rights and the rule of law and democracy might be like for them. And so that's kind of where these ideas of democracy and liberalism were born. When you think about it historically, um, this you know coincided with the advent of like, international human rights law and the you know during the aftermath of World War II, Hong Kong as a British colony sort of experienced that kind of global revolution, human rights and democracy that was happening elsewhere around the world. Yeah, that's exactly it. And Hong Kongers were kind of watching as they were this place that had, you know, free press and freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. And all these things were being locked in as kind of international covenants to safeguard people's human rights. They were experiencing those and journalism and all these other things could flourish in Hong Kong and kind of became the center of a lot of Asia in terms of things like journalism and human rights and all of that. And so it was this kind of place where all of that existed, kind of coinciding with its birth in the Western world, um, and this kind of unique way in the center of Asia, basically. And so in 1984, the British then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher signed the Sino-British Joint Declaration, um, which incited a kind of first wave of emigration from Hong Kong, as people were kind of looking towards what was at the time an opening or a slow opening of mainland China across the border and seeing kind of in horror what had happened during the course of the 20th century under Chairman Mao Zedong and under kind of just the rise of the Communist Party where there had been the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, and a whole wave of just kind of oppression of people's human rights. So that signing, that 1984 declaration between Margaret Thatcher's UK and the Chinese Communist Party inspired this wave of emigration from Hong Kong to presumably the UK, uh, because people sort of were fearful that what might what sort of happened in China might befall the people of Hong Kong. I think that was kind of the, the overwhelming concern for a lot of Hong Kongers that just this lifestyle they had grown used to and had grown up in um, might cease to exist moving forward. And so that kind of treaty set this, this almost kind of like, I don't know, doomsday time of death type um, mentality about 1997, um, July 1st, 1997, which was to be the official handover, quote unquote, of Hong Kong or the return of Hong Kong to Chinese rule. Um, and so a lot of people at the time had kind of looked to go abroad to a lot of Western countries, US, UK, Canada, Australia. Um, and that kind of period, I guess, between 84 and up until the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of people emigrated or a lot of people also not necessarily physically moved, but kind of made sure to guarantee themselves and their family foreign passports. And so a lot of my classmates growing up while they had been born and raised in Hong Kong and had some of them had never even set foot in the UK or US before had foreign Western passports as kind of like a safeguard should things go bad. On the other hand, there were people who stayed and, and sought to enshrine democratic values in Hong Kong's future. Chief among them, your godfather, Martin Lee, who was critical in establishing the basic law of Hong Kong. First, can you just explain who is Martin Lee for people who do not know him? He's, you know, I know of him. He's an internationally famous human rights scholar, legal scholar. He figures prominently in your life and in your book. Uh, but for those who are unaware, can you just briefly explain and describe who he is? Yeah, so Martin Lee, Lee Chu Ming, um, founded the Hong Kong's first Democratic Party 
um, in the kind of run up to the 1997 handover. And he, my mother actually worked for that Democratic Party when she, after her undergraduate um, years, and he, he has just kind of always been this very kind of prolific champion of Hong Kong's democracy and the rule of law. And he almost uniquely has kind of understood from the very beginning that all of these handover documents that were being drafted between Britain and China might not really properly and for the long haul safeguard Hong Kong's promised democracies and human rights and freedoms. Um, And so he has always kind of been a champion of the idea that the Hong Kong government will only protect Hong Kong's rule of law if it represents the Hong Kong people. And that's kind of been the whole basis of kind of his politics. And I guess just kind of why people are drawn to him and trust him, I think, with their, with their democracy and their government. What's included in the Hong Kong basic law? So the basic law is Hong Kong's constitution. It's a very liberal document, much like the kind of U.S. Constitution that promises a high degree of autonomy, a common law system that pre-existed under U.K. rule, along with its associated rule of law, um, which kind of covers everything from promises of free speech and other basic rights as guaranteed by U.N. human rights covenants that we kind of talked about just now. Um, and so the kind of, I guess, demands for compliance with these promises has always been the anchor for protests and political debate in Hong Kong. And that's kind of how, circling back to Martin Lee, he emerged in such prominence because during that kind of run-up to the 1997 handover, he was very active and very internationally active, I think, in pressuring the UK and pressuring China to make sure Hong Kongers were given these rights. Um, And kind of just pressuring internationally with, you know, Bill Clinton and other US, UK foreign powers that the kind of protection of democracy before Chinese takeover was very important. There is this line in your book that's kind of chilling now to read. It's uh, you quote Prince Charles, uh, who writes in his diary on the day of the handover in 1997, quote, thus we left Hong Kong to her fate and like the hope that the leader of the Democrats, Martin Lee, would not be arrested. So he was arrested earlier this year, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but uh, it's just like a, a chilling kind of um, foresight into and, and sort of premonition of what might happen following uh, the the handover. Uh, after 1997, how did like the fight for democracy and to defend democracy in Hong Kong evolve? I mean, I think that a lot of the fight was kind of grandfathered in when people like Martin and other democratic leaders kind of saw that there were, that while the basic law and while these other agreements had on paper kind of maybe shown that they were there to protect Hong Kong's democracy and freedom, that there were ways to circumvent that, that the Chinese Communist Party kind of really, especially recently, started latching onto. And so what has always kind of grounded Hong Kong's activism and Hong Kong's democratic movement, democracy movement, um, has been this sense that we have to protect and safeguard the promises of democracy and human rights that were supposedly enshrined in our basic law. I think this sense of kind of loss or this sense that China might overstep has always been what grounds massive protests. And so in 2003, um, the Hong Kong government likely kind of pushed on, egged on by the Chinese Communist Party, um, made a move under Article 23 to enact its first kind of national security law. Um, And at the time, 500,000 people had come out to protest as a collection of the city's top lawyers, including my dad, um, and legal scholars kind of came together to outline what exactly this meant for the city and that this was something that would really damage our democracy and our rule of law. Um, and so kind of fast forwarding to 2014, there was another massive protest when 
called the Umbrella Movement or Occupy Central when Hong Kongers were really pushing for universal suffrage, so one man, one vote, um, in the 2017 elections for chief executive who kind of functions as Hong Kong's president. Um, that this kind of, they saw that this was the moment to really kind of latch on to democracy. And when this failed, when it felt like Hong Kongers were once again losing autonomy and the rule of law and democracy, that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people came out to protest. And for 79 days, a lot, much of the city's kind of central business, central economic, financial um, districts were on a standstill as people took to the streets and people set up tents and really just occupied the space, the streets around the central government complex to get to fight for their universal suffrage and their right to vote. And then the next major protest movement uh, was in 2019, right, with like around the extradition bill. You know, it seems, you know, that the period from 2014 until today, but especially from 2019 till today, is a period of both accelerating activism, but also profound democratic decline in Hong Kong. So what happened in, in 2019 to kind of light this, this spark that has led to the outcome we're seeing today? Yeah, so in 2019... Um, the Hong Kong government introduced the kind of fugitive offenders amendment bill, which sparked a whole kind of series, months long anti extradition protests, which would have had the bill been passed, laid the groundwork for the transfer of fugitives into mainland China from really kind of anywhere in the world. Um, but most concerningly from Hong Kong, who at that time had kind of pro-democracy prisoners and political prisoners, but not to the scale at which we have them today. And so people were worried that you could kind of be transferred into the mainland legal system, which really lacks legality um, and lacks the rule of law. And you might just basically never resurface, which we've been seeing for years is what happens to a lot of human rights defenders and lawyers and activists across the border in mainland China. But the, the extradition bill was a trigger that kind of really allowed Hong Kongers to understand that the government did not understand or want to protect Hong Kong's autonomy and democracy and the rule of law. You know, on June 9th, 2019, Hong Kongers flooded to the streets. One million Hong Kongers came out to protest that day. Um, one of the largest later, protests in the history of the world. Like yeah, a- anywhere. one of the biggest. Yeah. <laughs> and there's all these crazy images that kind of emerge where people are literally just like packed in Hong Kong streets, kind of six lane streets, just flooded with people. And there's, it's honestly really humbling to see the pictures that emerge from that day. Um, and a week later, one million became two million, which was just, again, completely astounding. Um, and I wasn't there for these protests, but it was, I was watching from DC and just looking at the images coming out was something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, and they're definitely just like really striking and showed that in the city of, I think like 7.4 million people, 2 million coming out to protest is a really significant number. Um, and so those protests kind of, uh, they, from the perspective of a lot of Hong Kong's democracy leaders were, um, were peaceful protests that these first two, nothing violent happened. The kind of government allowed people to do what they needed to do to march through the streets. They were legal. The police had approved them. Um, the government had approved them, but kind of very quickly, I think July 1st might have been the first violent day. Um, protests turned violent and that kind of occurred when the police started cracking down. They started spraying pepper spray, um, tear gas into the crowds. Eventually it started being rubber bullets. Um, and just kind of like the beating up of people from pro China kind of demonstrators, but also from the police, which was really scary for a lot of Hong Kongers because the police force had for a long time been one of the finest in Asia. Um, and so things started turning violent and a sense of just kind of deep desperation began emerging from the people that this was kind of like 
an all or nothing last battle that you just had to give this fight your everything because if you didn't no matter the outcome if you didn't give it your all you hong kong would probably be lost um and as we know now hong kong is kind of lost anyway but people really did just they came out and they in remarkable numbers every week every weekend for months and months and months and there were kind of boycotts where union workers or doctors or professors and business professionals would just boycott work for the day and just sit in anywhere really and not go to work and so there was this sense of really collective energy that even if you weren't someone who was on the front front lines risking arrest putting your kind of body on the line that you were supporting the movement you were donating money to you know legal aid foundations you were getting food for the protesters which were largely young people you were you know participating in class boycotts you were kind of doing whatever you could um to support the movement and it was always this understanding that that did not have to be you going out to a protest and risking your kind of freedom and risking arrest and everything. So your book begins on the day that the national security law is promulgated and that seems to be something of a final nail in the coffin of democratic aspirations in Hong Kong. Can you briefly describe what that law entails? So it kind of, in its language, which was very vague and is very kind of loosely defined, the the law prevents, stops, and punishes crimes of succession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces. And in its language, because it's so vague and so loosely defined, this really effectively just criminalizes anything that might be deemed as harmful to the government and to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and kind of something really scary about this law is that it can be applied to anyone anywhere. And while obviously it targets Hong Kongers and people locally grounded in Hong Kong more than anyone else, um, it is possible to be come almost kind of like a um, – it is possible to be convicted or to at least be accused of breaking the national security law as someone standing in the U.S. or in the U.K. or really anywhere else in the world, which did in fact happen. Yeah, I mean, like your writing of the book could be construed to be a violation of the national security law and presumably expose you to legal jeopardy. Hopefully not, but yeah. <laughs> Um, but someone it, it did expose to legal jeopardy is, is Martin Lee. Can, do you know how he's doing today? Um, out of concern for his well-being, my family doesn't really talk with him anymore. Um, my parents um, are very politically active. They're both professors. Um, my dad's a legal scholar. My mother teaches poli-sci. And they have both been very vocal in the protection or to demand and defend the protection of Hong Kong's democracy and human rights and freedom. Um, my mother started an NGO with a couple other kind of U.S.-based activists called Hong Kong Democracy Council. Um, one of those activists has been, um, I guess, accused of breaking the national security law, um, who is a born Hong Konger. His dad was actually arrested um, a couple years ago for organizing the Occupy Central Umbrella Movement protests. Um, and so out of all of that concern, my family doesn't keep up communication with Martin, um, who is now at home. He's serving, what is it, a suspended prison sentence. And so he was convicted of kind of, I guess, orchestrating protests, unauthorized assembly for a protest on April 18th, um, along with... 14 other democracy leaders in a very powerful coordinated move one morning by the Hong Kong government and police force. Um, and he was convicted on March 31st, 2021 and kind of escorted, I guess that first day when he was arrested from the apartment he lives in that I had regularly gone to visit as a child. Um, and he, on April 16th, 2021, he was sentenced for 11 months, but exempt from prison time because of his advanced age. He's in his 80s and his long contribution to the community is what they kind of cited for a lot of people and including, you know, the Washington Post 
did an op-ed on what Martin Lee's conviction might mean. And it really just would have, if he had been sentenced to prison time as well, it would have just clearly marked the death of Hong Kong's rule of law. And it would have been a very public and very internationally renowned person to put behind bars. One of the, I think, arguments of the defense attorneys was that 1.7 million people had peacefully marched that day that Martin was accused of having an authorized assembly and for organizing a protest August 18th, 2019. Um, and so if we're convicting Martin Lee and these other high profile democracy leaders, we're really also convicting or at least, you know, kind of in words, this 1.7 million other people that were there as well. Um, and the fact being that Martin had attended the protests and was a very high profile attendee of the protest, but was not, in fact, at all one of the organizers of it. So, so far, we've done, a, I think, a very good job of not speaking very directly about your book. I think what we've done is really set a kind of historic and political background for the stories that you tell in your book. And I do that deliberately because all of you should buy the book. Um, but one thing I do want to kind of probe you on, and something you do get into in, in, in the book a bit, is this question of your generation and its sort of place in this struggle for democracy in Hong Kong. You know, your generation, that born right after the 1997 handover and a point you make, may be the last to really have experienced and tasted freedom in Hong Kong. You know, you graduated from high school, what, like five or six years ago? 2016. Um, yeah, 2016. So high schoolers today couldn't be doing the same things that you are doing in high school. They are having the kind of memory of Hong Kong's democracy erased in a kind of formal way. And this, I think, is one of the more chilling and more profound kind of takeaways I, I gleaned from your book. I basically grew up with my parents usually going to these protests from Pretty much, I mean, the first one I went to was in my womb, the handover protests, um, and not my womb, but um, the I've gone pretty much to every single, you know, June 4th candlelight vigil for in memory of the Tiananmen massacres in Beijing in 1989. I've gone to nearly every July 1st march on the handover anniversary, um, nearly every October 1st march on China's National Day. Um, and I had even covered a couple of those when interning for newspaper in Hong Kong. But it it was these were all kind of staples for people growing up. And even if you weren't someone or a part of a family that might attend these, they were just staples in everyone's kind of annual calendar of things that would happen. Um, and they kind of function as basically, you know, a political education for a lot of young people in Hong Kong because they were just kind of understood to be a routine and that we could go and commemorate, you know, the thousands of people that were murdered in 1989. We could go out and protest the handover, protest the fact that the kind of promises made at the time of democracy and human rights hadn't been realized. Um, and for a lot of people, a lot of the kind of very now prominent young activists and politicians in Hong Kong, um, moments such as 2012, where the government tried to introduce national education in the school curriculum or 2014 when the umbrella movement happened were moments where they rose into prominence and into notoriety um, because they were just kind of, I don't know, galvanized by what Hong Kong's democracy meant for their immediate future. Um, and one of the most critical points being that in 1997, the promise was 50 years of this kind of basic law promise of constitutional liberal freedoms um, and of the protection of our democracy and human rights, which would be set to expire or be reevaluated in 2047. Um, and in 2047, I'll be 49 years old. A lot of the people who kind of rose to prominence or who really just put themselves on the front line in 2019 or before would be in their 40s and 50s at that time with, you know, theoretically kids and a whole career and a whole life ahead of them still. And so people really got 
I think, really rallied around this idea that it was our immediate future at stake, that, you know, 2047, my parents will be older, like they'll be in their 70s, 80s. And it kind of, not that it doesn't matter, but it matters less at that time, right? And so people were really, they felt threatened by this kind of deadline for Hong Kong, this kind of time of death that we all were looking towards. And so people really came out. And that, I think, is what drove a lot of the young people into the protest, this kind of fear of what the future might mean, a very visceral fear of what the future might mean, I should say, because it threatened our immediate kind of lifeline. Uh, well, Hannah, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much for writing this book. It's just so well written and vital, and I am so glad to have been a part <laughs> I'm of. I'm glad. It thank you so much for <laughs> wanting me to write this book. <laughs> All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you to Hannah. And I just am so proud of how this book turned out. You know, seeing this book come into the world has been one of the more meaningful professional accomplishments uh, in my career. And so I'm just so excited and uh, interested to see how it is received. And a huge congratulations to Hana, who is an absolutely brilliant writer and rising star and all. I'll be excited to see where her career advances and progresses. All right, we'll see you next time. Link to the book is in the show notes on globaldispatches.org and at globaldispatchespodcast.com. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.